Next week will be the end of our series, Hope Rising. Um, we'll be preaching. I'll be speaking a message from Jeremiah 29, 11. Some of you know that scripture, um, but it says that uh, where God says, I have come to give you a hope in a future. Okay? And so um, that's going to be next week. We'll also be uh, highlighting some of our graduates. And this has, been a, has this been a wonderful series on hope? Yeah. Uh, I, I, Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. At some point in your life, you're going to need hope. Or there's someone you love that's going to need some hope from you. And you know where to get it from, from the Lord. Uh, today we're talking about the subject of grief. And uh, I just wonder, um, you know, how many of us have ever lost a loved one before? Let me see. If you just lost a loved one. How many of you have a friend walking through that right now? Anybody got a friend walking through it right now? Yeah. So some of you raised your hand. I'm the friend. <laughs> uh, my dad passed, and, and I'm kind of feeling some new feelings. And when we put the series together, we knew that today was going to be called Hope and Grief. And um, I knew that the day would come where I'd have an opportunity to interview one of my friends. He's a part of this church and has walked through some, uh, he and his family, some tremendous loss. And today is going to be very enriching and I think your, the understanding of God's grace is going to deepen in your heart, and you're going to be equipped to walk alongside people who need some hope. So uh, this is my friend on the screen, Greg Meadows, and he's sharing a bit of his story of what they've experienced. Go ahead and watch this. I don't like the phone. I remember the morning the phone rang. After seven years of building my construction company from nothing, I answered a call from the FBI. This initial conversation eventually led to the bankruptcy of my company and the loss of all my family's income and worldly possessions. The officer on the other, on the other end of the line informed me that one of my clients, who I had never personally met, had embezzled millions of dollars from his his development company and its investors and was under federal investigation. At that time, he owed me almost $4 million. During the course of the conversation, I realized my life as I knew it was about to take a hard turn. I would never be paid. All the long days, all the long nights, all the time and sweat dedicated to the success of my dream would be destroyed. For the next three years, I tried to hold on but it was not to be. It is hard to bury your dreams. I remember the morning the phone rang, the morning my father called. He had to tell me my mother had been killed in a car accident. He had also been injured in the accident, but even though he was in pain, he had to call my brothers and me and deliver the devastating news three separate calls to his sons and then a call to my grandmother, my mom's mom. I can't describe the pain in his voice. A still, calm, anguished voice. It was then I realized the only thing worse than hearing terrible news is telling someone you love terrible news about someone they also love. I remember my wife asking me if we should wake the children and tell them about their grandma. I said no. Their life was about to change and I wanted just a few more moments for them to feel all was okay. I think God gives us wisdom in the moment we really need. I remember the morning the phone rang. We received a call from my oldest daughter's work asking if we knew where she was. My wife answered the next call. The gentleman on the other end asked to speak to her husband. I'm thankful for that. She handed me the phone. The call was from the King County Coroner's Office, informing me my daughter had been killed in a collusion by a wrong way drunk driver. My wife looked at me and all I could do at first was to tell her to get dressed. It was going to be a hard day. It's a day that won't end. Again, I think God gives us grace in the moment. 
I then had to tell my wife our daughter had been suddenly and terribly killed. That morning, my oldest son woke up first, and I told him to wake his brothers and sisters. All he told them was they needed to get up, and he thought there might be something wrong with Heather. I then had to tell them she was dead. Delivering terrible news to your children is terrible. I remember the morning the phone rang. A call from an Orlando, Florida detective. He asked me a few questions about my family and then told me my oldest son had overdosed and was deceased. He had my son's phone and I was listed as Pops. After years of struggle with addiction and a year of being clean, he had relapsed and unknowingly used fentanyl. The de detective determined it an accident. It was a short conversation. I then had to tell my wife our oldest son was dead. It was incredibly difficult as I had to make several phone calls, separate phone calls to each of his brothers and sisters to tell them their brother was dead. A father's heart can only take so much. I am fully warned. I don't like the phone. It was uh, several years ago on an Easter that I got the news that Heather had been in that accident and, and she'd passed, went to be with the Lord. And uh, this family, Meadows family, and our family, we were in the same small group. And uh, there's, there's this seasons where God puts you together. I think the Bible says that Jesus fits his whole body together perfectly. And uh, what an honor it's been to be a part of the Meadows lives, to be considered uh, not only their pastor, but their friend, and to kind of walk some of these steps and to watch them walk it out. And so um, Greg and Leah have served in our church in a variety of ways, as well as being elders in our church. Um, and uh, Greg has coached a lot of sports in the community. He's known by many for coaching some of the different uh, little leagues and, and uh, football teams. And uh, uh, he, he um, also um, oversaw the entire project of this building being built. And so, um, and I, so I'm, I'm honored to share the stage with them today, and I, I wanted just to introduce him. And not only as somebody who loves Jesus, but outside of this space, he was also the lead on the Hood Canal Project. Uh, I don't know if you know the, about that bridge that we have. And so um, God's used him in a way to bless our community. And so would you welcome with me my friend Greg Meadows as he comes onto the stage. Uh, Greg, you, you've written a book, and it's called A Walk with Job, Walking with Those in the Valley of the Shadow. And I think that's a, is that you in the picture? Yeah. Okay. I was just, and uh, it's, a, it's a picture of you and two of your boys walking kind of in, on a road, on a path, and then a picture in the back uh, with, with some of your sons, and then that's, a, that's the cross wall that's out there. Yeah. And uh, that wall is meaningful to you. I know that. Uh, in honor, um, uh, you, you and your sons, I think, did that wall in honor of your daughter, Heather. Yeah. So uh, that's, a, that's pretty special. Um, I, I bought a bunch of these books. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so we have 100 of these out in the lobby today. If you are going through grief, you know somebody walking through it. Um, anybody who doesn't have the money, I bought 10 of them to give away. And so if you need one of those, we want to hand those to you. But I wanted to take a moment and kind of walk through some of uh, what God's been teaching you in this season. And you called the book A Walk with Job. Uh, one of the questions that I had, Greg, is this, how do you walk a hard road? I mean, what do you, did you have any moments where you just didn't even want to get up in the morning? And how do you keep moving forward? Yeah, I, um, you know, the older I get, the uh, shorter the answer becomes. And it's just basically that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
you are with me. And that's, that's everything. That's, that's it. You um, call it a walk with Job. And uh, I know the book of Job has become really meaningful to you. Aren't, it's interesting how it's, certain books in the Bible mean more at different times in your life. Aren't you, can you imagine the Bible if we pulled Job out and it wasn't even there? And it's a story of somebody who's endured tremendous loss and walking through that. Why were you drawn to the book of Job so strongly? Yeah, yeah. I would say that, um, you know, when you go through tragedy, when you go through things in your life that are, are so impactful, you're drawn certain ways. And really, the Bible and the book of Job were really the only books that I could go to at that time. And... I've really come to see the book of Job as a book of grace, a story of grace. Um, it's just one of those few books, and, and I just love the way the book of Job starts. It starts out and says, in the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. And I, I've always had kind of a quiet appreciation for that, that it's like, come on in, sit for a while. And let me tell you the story of an extraordinary man. Let me tell you the story of a good man, but just a man. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I was drawn to Job so much, is it, it, it's just about that story. And the book of Job really reminds us that others have walked this path before us. We're not the first ones to walk down a hard path. Hmm. We're not Job. Um, God's always been there, and he always will be there. Um, you know, you talked about the book, and it kind of started out as just a thank you, because so many people had come beside us during these times, you know, yourself included. And um, I didn't really start out to do that, but as the words progressed through the page... It just became a story of grace. And um, it revealed to me, how do you walk with somebody who's walking through the valley of the shadow? And what I found was, it was those that came along beside us and just became the embodiment of grace to us. And, and so quite a few of those stories or those elements are in the, in the book there because I, I realized it was more about how people came beside us and, and then what I was, may want to say or want to do, and it's just a story of grace. Um, the other thing is the book of Job, and this gets a little harder, it kind of helps me process the question, because we get this question a lot, is why do bad things happen to good people? And I always ask, well, what's the definition of good? But it kind of helps him to process because Job always points to the sovereignty of God. But it is a hard conversation. And I think that that's part of the reason why you get drawn to Job is, your, is you become very okay with hard conversations when you're in the middle of them. Some of those hard conversations, there's got to be some moments where you have anger towards God even. And you read Job, there's emotion. One of the questions I think I have in this, and I hear this, is, is it okay to be angry with God? You know, can you be, can you be, can you be angry with God? Well, I'll give you my opinion, <laughs> which is, yeah, yes, I think so. I think we see it in the Psalms, you see it in the Laments, you see other places where people are going, Lord, what, what is going on here? Um, I don't get it. And I had a friend of ours, my wife and I, and he also had, and he's passed since, but he also had two of his children pass away. One, his daughter when she was young, and then his um, son when he was older. And, and I remember him saying that when he dies, he wants to be buried with two rocks. Because when he stands before God, he's going to throw them at him for taking his children. And I thought, yeah, I understand that. 
I know that feeling. And I think that um, a lot of times, you know, we get caught up in different things and, and we look at different parts of the Bible about anger for God. But there's a section, and I've asked Wes to read it the way we normally read things, and that is in John 11, 21 through 26, and then 32. Okay. John 11, uh, starting with verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. And Jesus told her, I'm the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Verse 32. When Mary arrived and saw Jesus, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet I think that so many times we read past it, and I ask us to read it like that because that's how I've heard it so many times. Thanks. And just didn't want to throw him under the bus here, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but see, I read it differently now because the way I read it is with anger and resignation. Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Where were you? What was so important that you couldn't be here? We've supported you, we've been part of you, and you weren't here. You saved so many, why not my brother? Why wasn't my brother worth saving? Why am I not worth a moment of your time? And for me, it became, why not my children? Sorry. Where were you? Why were my kids not worth it? Why weren't we worth just a moment of your time? There's an honest anger in that question. And I think God hears that. And honestly, I think the book of Job helps me resolve that. And I think it's answered, but you have to get through the harshness of the reply. And I think if you look at Job 40, or Job 38, 1, through four, and I'm going to skip through parts, but read most of this. Then the Lord answered Job, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? So there'd been all this discourse, and God then speaks, who is this? And he says, I will question you, and you answer me, where were you when I laid the foundation of, earth, of the earth? Who marked off its dimensions? Who stretched the measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who'd laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? And I think that what that shows me is that it's about the vastness of God, that it's about the vastness of the sovereignty of God. It's about the grace of God because what God is saying is he's showing Job because there's, there's chapters that go on after this. And he's showing Job that it's the vastness of creation. He uses that as an example to say it's the vastness of eternity. Which gives us just a small glimpse. Just a small glimpse of what eternal grace looks like. And we can't miss it. And I think it's important to remember that Jesus also knew the number of hairs on Job's children's heads. Jesus also knew their names like he knew my children's names. And he gathered his sheep in his time. And I think it's a reflection of the character of grace and God, of God. And I think Job gets it because he says in 42, 3, he says, You asked, Lord, who is it? Who is it? that obscures my counsel without knowledge. 
And he says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. In your book, um, there's, uh, you, you let me read some of it before it was published. And uh, reading through it, there was one part that's my favorite part. <laughs> and it's the part of, it just drew me into the story. And it was, uh, as a boy, you would go visit your grandmas. And your grandma and grandpa lived a little ways away. And you talk about that as kind of a metaphor of what God was teaching you or training or preparing you. So can you talk about that? And it's, it's right here in your book. It just talks about how, was it chapter two? Yeah, page five. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he'd forget. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for not throwing me under the bus. Yeah, well, this is a small bus. <laughs> yeah, it just... What the chapter, and you can read it for yourself now, the, if you want. Um, but when I was a young boy, my, my grandparents lived in uh, one set in New Mexico and another set in Missouri, so states away. And, you know, when I was a young boy, <laughs> we didn't have iPhones and CDs and iPods. This was before, um, you know, we had eight track tape players, <laughs> but not my family. <laughs> and uh, so we'd pack up. And it was a long two-day drive to get to see Grandma in Grandpa's house. It was a long journey. And because there was nothing to do on the way, it, what God showed me through that time is how to be still. I had to learn how to be still, sitting in the back seat of a station wagon, or a station wagon driving across the desert with nothing to do but look out the window, taught me how to be still, to be calm, to be quiet, to understand that there's more than just what you see. That there's, a, there's that time for God to give you that reflection and that moment. And so that's what that was. It, was, it just taught me how to be sp still and calm. And, and I write quite a bit on that, but I've been asked about that question from others that have, have talked about it. And they, said, and they feel like maybe they missed it. Like, hey, I missed this part of my life. And I said, no, man. I was in my 50s before I realized that this was some training that God had given me in stillness and preparation. And so I don't think that that's, that's too bad. I realized this is how God was helping me learn to be still and navigate life's difficult deserts. And, and you know, we used to be in that home group years ago. And uh, after Wes was leading and I led, and um, I used to do this thing for the for the group and I would say, hey, this week you're gonna tell us your story. And we'd go through everybody and sometimes it was couples and sometimes it was single people and, and they'd all start the same way, name, rank, and serial number, how we, we always tend to do it. I said, no, no, where were you born? What was your childhood like? And they'd start to talk about it. Where did you meet each other? And they'd tell us that story. When did you meet Jesus? And we'd hear about that. And my point is, is all of you have a story. There are things that God has drawn you through that may not be big events. They're not things that you looked out and said, wow, God showed me this then. But there's things where God told you to be still so that he could show up in a whisper and speak to your heart. So think about that. Uh, I, I love the line. It's a, it's a long way for a small boy to the desert but that's how you get to grandma's house. Yeah. <laughs> that's how you get to grandma's house. Yeah. The um, scriptures say, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, it's the chapter of love. At the end of it, it says, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And I know that, that there was a season where you struggled a little bit with that verse, and maybe you talk on that. Yeah, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Why does it say it like that? A lot of times when I read the Bible, I think, why does it say it like that? You know, um, faith, hope, and love. Faith is important. Hope's important. We hear a lot about it, but the greatest of these is love. And I really struggle. Why did, what does that mean? And then my daughter was killed by a drunk driver. And... Uh, I think that, sorry, need to uh, reset. 
And I think that it's, my faith was shattered. My hope was gone. But I'll tell you that the hooks of grace, as I've called, come to call them, held me. And what I mean by that is I really tried to flee from God. I did. I tried to flee. I tried to wrestle myself away from God. But his hooks of grace held me. And the only way I can really explain it was when my children were real small, like maybe two years old, and we had six children. Um, there'd always be something that'd throw them into a fit. And they'd be tired and cranky. You'd be out at the shop. Of course, it's some public place, and you're, you're at the grocery store. And they uh, all of a sudden lose it because they want a cookie. And you know, we don't give them a cookie because we're good parents. And so they fall on the floor, and they flail. And that was me, right? And so I'd go to grab them, and they'd get up, and they'd try to flee and run. But I'd grab them up because, you know, they're two and not very fast. <laughs> and uh, I grab them up, and I remember they just were losing it, and I'd hold them tight. I'd bring them into my chest, and they'd struggle, and they'd struggle, and they'd fight, and I'd hold them tighter. And they'd, they'd try to cry out loud, and I'd bring them close, and I'd, with just this smothering grasp almost, just like, nope, <laughs> you're not leaving. I am holding you. I'm keeping you here. And they'd struggle until finally they would begin to tire of the fight, of the struggle. Finally, they would bury their head. And as they quieted down, that tight smothering grasp of mind would become a loosely held, comforting hold on them. And they'd fall asleep in my arms, on my chest. And I think that's what it's like in trying to leave and tried to flee from God, he said, no, I'm going to hold you so tight. You just don't realize it. And I had to look back to see that. That when my faith was tattered and frayed and my hope was buried and gone, his smothering love held me because the greatest of these is love. That's where it came. We uh, have a prayer that we've prayed a lot here at the church. Jesus, I'm your disciple. I want to show your love to this world. Yeah. These are your hands. These are your feet. Give me your heart. Speak through me. Show me what you see. Use me today. And that the concept of the body of Christ and the hands and feet, I know that that has taken on new meaning for you uh, uh, would, would you talk about how that relates to the subject of grief? Yeah, I think that, you know, we hear that a lot. And I thought about it, and I was thinking about it one day, and I think it's important that we understand that when we say that we are the hands and feet of Jesus, that we also understand that that is where they drove the nails. That there's a gravity to the statement. That there will be times when it's difficult and we're walking with others that are having, feel like they have the nails being driven. They feel that pain. And what that did for me is it helped me understand that blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Why? Because we weep with those who weep. We walk with those through difficulty. There's a gravity to what we say we're going to do. We, these shouldn't be empty words or just something we pray and move on from. But it also reminded me that without the nails, there is no empty tomb. And so the importance and the blessing of the nails come as part of that gravity. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about hope? You know, we, in West I've talked, obviously, you know, and Proverbs 13, 12, says that hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And again, another thing I struggled with some, that statement, because for me, for a very long time, hope deferred meant hope destroyed. There was no deferral. It was just destruction. But lately, I've begun to translate it differently. And I don't know, this is God walking me through stuff, I think. And that is that it's become hope deferred, has become hope defined. 
And what I mean by that is that now I know the time. The de definition of time of my hope, which is from March 13th, 2005, and October 9th, 2017, until the day I go home, until the day I'm in the home country, as C.S. Lewis called, that's the time. That hope is defined. But I want to be clear about something. Because people say, that's when you get to see your children. My hope defined, my hope is in Christ and Christ alone. My hope is, is knowing that he is the home country. My hope is that my children, all my children, that I get to see them held by him. They are not mine to hold. They are his, and my hope is in Christ, in Christ alone. For me, I've come to realize that hope is not based on what I think. It's not based on what I feel. It's not based on what I see. Hope is based on what I know, but more importantly, hope, my hope is based on who knows me. For me, hope is simply unseen truth. My hope is based on grace. Hope is based on who knows me. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I was, uh, we had a number of people raising their hands saying, I've lost a loved one, or I'm walking alongside somebody who's going through grief right now. What would you want them to hear? What, do you, what would you want to say to that person sitting out there today? Yeah, you know, Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, uh, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. And I think that, you know, we've all heard the saying that time heals all wounds. But I don't think so. Not all wounds. The years don't necessarily lighten the load. They just give you time to figure out how to carry it. And uh, I will tell you, tough days will come along oh, to me unannounced and hard moments without knowing. And I've had to learn how to walk through those. Um, and I don't think a continuous, continual sense of mourning will ever leave me, but I also don't think it should. But I also know that a continual sense of grace comes with it. Maybe I can leave you with a little story if I have time. The, the light, John 1, 5 says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And I'll tell you, years ago, when I was in high school, actually a freshman in high school, so barely in high school, and I told this story about four or five years ago. Some of you may remember it at, the, at a... Um, Good Friday. Yeah, Good Friday gather. That's right. Yeah. And... Uh, but uh, every year, we would go out on a backpacking trip. Uh, the, our high school youth group did, our church youth group. And this year was the first year, and I got to go, and I was all excited. And so well, the way it worked is we'd, we'd go, drive up to the mountains, hike in for a week and base camp near someplace. And then during the week, you could go for, you know, walks and, or go fish the lake or go on day hikes and do different things. And so about the middle of the week, about a dozen of us or so decided, hey, let's go see what's over the next ridge. So we took off and we went walking, right? And uh, as we were walking along, it was a beautiful day. Ah, consider the lilies, you know, just beautiful. And, and as we uh, continued on and the day lingered, finally it was getting late in the afternoon and the sun was starting to go down. Oh, we better get back to base camp, you know. And Keep in mind, I'm like 13 years old. So... We start, you know, back, and as we start returning to camp, most of the group actually kind of dawdled for a little bit longer, and they were older, and, but three of us took off, my older brother, another guy, and myself, and uh, started heading across. And as dusk began to approach, we thought, boy, it's getting dark, and um, we came across a fork in the road, and one trail went up along the ridge, and the other went down next to the lake. And we thought, well, we're camped on the other side of this big lake. Let's take the lake trail. So we did. Um, walked as briskly as we could. But as we were walking along, finally night fell. 
and darkness kind of overcame us as we're walking along. We could still walk and see a little bit, but, you know, it's getting dark. It's dark. Night had come, and we had no light. So we hurriedly moved along, thinking we'll get back to camp soon, when we came to a sudden stop. There was a steep slope up to our left, and out of that steep slope protruded this massive rock out into the lake, blocking our path. We looked up at it, we looked up at the slope, we looked out here and was like, oh, man. We talked a minute about going back and going around, but it was too far and we didn't really know the way. Finally, my, we tried to help each other over, and that wasn't going to happen. So my brother and I, we tried to, tried to get around the rock. We go wading out into the lake, and by the time it was up to our waist about, we said, and then he reached out, and it just dropped off. We went back. So there we stood. We couldn't go left. The slope was too steep. We couldn't go forward. The rock was too big. We couldn't go to the right, the lake was too deep, and we couldn't go back, we didn't know the way. So we stood there in the darkness, scared, alone, and now wet. So we began to yell for help, but hoping someone would hear us. But as our time grew longer, I can tell you that my my fear grew greater. I was just a young boy, far away from home, standing in the dark with my hope fading away. Darkness brings despair. Darkness brings fear. And then we heard something. Far away, we heard somebody, some voices. Somebody was coming from the camp to find us. Someone was looking for us. We called back, I'm telling you. <laughs> and finally, finally, as we saw this, we started to see a light break over the top of this rock. And as that light crested the apex of that light, that rock and shone down on us as a big flashlight, we felt the incredible relief of being found. Someone showed up. And I'll tell you, it, what a relief. But there we stood. But I'll tell you the, something else. As that light shone down, this big light, and overcame our darkness, it revealed something else. It revealed something that we never saw in the darkness of our night. Someone had cut steps just where that large boulder protruded out of that steep slope, maybe this wide. The path was always there. But the darkness of our night hid it from us. And I can tell you, at that moment, we didn't need a uh, lesson on pathfinding or preparation. We didn't need a discussion about staying calm in a bad situation. We didn't need a lesson on survival skills or what to take and don't leave the, leave the group. Well, all we needed was someone to hold the light. And I'll tell you, when our friends are suffering and night has closed in, when they can't see past the darkness that encompasses them, just be still. Just be present. Just be calm. And simply point to and hold the light. One of the things, last things I wrote was Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I'm God. And I will tell you that when in the midst of this anguish of the heart and my grief and pain is all I can see, I need your stillness. 
I need your calm, quiet presence. When all around me is crumbling and the long desert of confusion seems to be my lot, I need your steadfast calm. I need you to be the bringer of peace. I need you to just sit with me and be present. I can tell you something. I want you here. I need you here. You are God's whisper to me. But please, don't talk at me. Just be fully present. And please, be still. And that's what I would say. Well, uh, Greg, thank you for having the courage and the grace to share your story with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.